Okay. Um, so it looks like I'm going to be talking to you today about designing an HTTP client. It's what it says on the slide. Uh, for the purposes of coherency, that's what I'll try to do. There's also a name on the slide. It says Tom Christie. You can call me that if you like, for the purposes of coherency. Uh, briefly, me, I work full-time developing open source for a living with a sponsorship model for our funding. Uh, some of the software that myself and the collaborators that I work with have designed and built while we've been working with this include the API framework, Django REST framework, the documentation tool, MacDocs, tooling for the ASCII web ecosystem, including Uvicorn and Starlet, and uh, the project that I've been spending most of my attention on lately, which is HTTPX, or maybe HuttupX. I don't know why you would say HuttupX but it has an X at the end. I wonder what that's about. Mm. So the con a little historical context that HTTPX exists within, um, there was already a very well-established HTTP client for Python request, which I expect almost all of you here will know of. Um, But let us not say requests. Actually, when we're talking about requests, quite important to think in terms of the context of requests. Request actually has two main elements to the project, because request is actually a project that's built on top of another existing HTTP client, URL lib3. Uh, the big innovation that requests bought was that it bought a level of finesse and design to the API on top of URL lib3, and as well as addressing some functionality aspects that it bought on top of that. Um, but URL3 is the project that actually deals with the core networking layer for requests. Um, one of the things that I'd like to mention at this point in time, if you're looking for examples of really well-managed um, open source teams who do a really good job of both the design work, but also in terms of how they work together and support their community, I think the URL3 team are absolutely excellent and should go and look at how they manage their projects. Um, also interesting to note at this point, they've spent a lot of design work on um, improving the UX of URL Lab 3. So if you're working with requests, you don't necessarily need to do that any longer. You could look at just using URL Lab 3 directly. Anyway, given that those two things already existed, why HTTPX? So the original motivation for working in this area was addressing two headline features that were missing, still are missing from requests. So there's HTTP2 support, and there's async support. Um, we would like an, a, a Python HTTP client that's able to take advantage both of HTTP1 and the sometimes performance benefits that HTTP2 provides. Uh, we'd also like a Python HTTP client that's able to support usage in the async execution environment. Now, there is already an HTTP client that exists for this, which is AIO HTTP, um, but that only works in the async context, so you can use that, say, if you're working with the fast API web framework. Uh, requests only works in the threaded context, so you can use that, say, if you're working with something like Flask and sending API requests. We'd like an API client that is able to equally, to work equally well in either context. So those were the two headline features that HTTPX was originally introduced to address. 
as well as meeting all of the functionality that requests provides. There was also an element of wanting to take on a bit of an intentional design refresh. So where uh, requests really excels is at the high level API, but because it's been built on top of URL lib3 in a way that those project authors hadn't originally intended, when you start to get down to some of the really lower level bits of the networking API, it doesn't always fit together quite as well as it might. So being able to have a design refresh that works all the way through the stack. Um, we did spend a chunk of time looking at whether we'd be able to bring this functionality into the requests project directly, whether we'd be able to work with the URL Web 3 team and do something like that ended up being too complex, but still, essentially, what the project is aiming for is an iteration on top of the good design work that Request already provides in that space. Uh, that's a picture of the Pompidou Center in Paris. I didn't take that photograph, so maybe it's not that authentic. Uh, I did download it with HTTPX, so maybe it tastes a little bit of HTTPX. In this context, context is important. Um, so these are some of the sorts of ways that I would describe the design intent that we've bought when we've been building HTTPX. And I realize that these are just flavorful words. I'm not going to demonstrate in great depth how they apply, but I believe that they're meaningful. And when I say things like low complexity stack, the sorts of things that I'm interested in is Sometimes when you're working with Python packages, you can end up with a bunch of submerged complexity because you have dependencies that um, sometimes you have a bunch of submerged complexity. I like making sure we don't have submerged complexity and that you've got uh, something with kind of minimal dependencies or that at least has a minimal dependency install available um, that uh, a single developer ought to be able to come to this code base and comprehensively understand all the different layerings of the stack and feel like there's a unified design that runs all the way through those things. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. That's a picture of the Bauhaus building in Berlin. You can tell really easily because it's very definitive about what it would like to be called. There are probably other buildings that say Bauhaus on the side, but they wouldn't be the Bauhaus building. Uh, this is, or at least it's a photograph of it, but it's also a bit it as well. Uh, this is the repository, what's the, what do you call this? The, it's the, yes, it's the organization repo homepage. Thank you, Marcelo. Yeah, it's been really chaotic lately. So I'm just having to ad lib. Uh, oh well. We have the two major components that make up HTTPX here. So we have HTTPX, which is the high-level API, analogous to requests. And we have HTTP core, which is the core networking package that we rely on, which is, at least in that context, analogous to um, URL lib3 and the space that URL lib3 occupies for requests. Here's our documentation homepage for HTTPX. You can tell that this is the high-level API because it has a pretty picture of a butterfly on it. And I like butterflies. And I did take this picture. And this is a butterfly in a butterfly house near to where I live. And if you came and visited me, maybe we could go to the butterfly house. And this butterfly will be dead. <laughs> Is it funny? I don't know. Well, anyway, I, it's fine. Uh, you can tell that this is our homepage for HTTP core. You can tell that this is the lower level 
networking package because it doesn't have a pretty picture of a butterfly, even though I like butterflies. Mm. No, this is a very seriously minded document. Very seriously minded folks. Oh, that's quite exhausting just to look at. Um, you have a really nice requests t-shirt, by the way, over there. I really like that. It's nice. It's not from Reason. Is it not? It looks so similar. Ah, okay. Oh, you can tell me, but I'll ask you about that later. Um, so on one side, we've got the stack of uh, concerns that HTTP core needs to deal with. On the other side, we've got the stack of concerns that HTTPX needs to deal with. So HTTP core is designed with the intent of providing the simplest possible API that we can bring to the table that allows for dealing with the, well, sending an HTTP request and getting an HTTP response and dealing with the connection pooling and the proxy implementations and the networking concerns in order to do that. And HTTPX is everything else over the top. So some of the things which are written down on the other side are, for example, uh, redirects. We don't deal with redirects at all in HTTP core. Um, there's all of the bringing nicer API models over the top of the requests and responses. So whereas HTTP core has a very, very bare bones approach to the API, HTTPX brings nicer object models on top of that. Um, there's also the... Um, so when you, when you make a request and you download a response, the process of going from the, the byte-wise content that you get back in the response, if you were getting that from HTTP core, things that we're not doing include uh, content compression. So if you've added in compression, uh, I can support compression headers, that layer is dealt with in HTTPX. And also, how on earth do you go from the byte-wise content that you've got in a response into, oh, well, here's some actual Unicode text. Um, which character encoding are we going to use? And the, anyway, there's an awful lot of different elements that HTTPX brings over the top. But the helpful thing design-wise is to have a really clear separation of responsibility of these two packages so that when you're looking at and trying to comprehend one of them, you don't need to have in your mind at all any of the design space of the other. And HTTPX actually plugs into a bunch of different possible transports of which HTTP core is only one of them. So the other interesting thing that you can do with HTTPX is you can plug it directly into uh, your WSGI app, such as, you know, if you have a Flask app that you're building, you can plug uh, HTTPX directly into that using it as a test client without having to make actual network requests through it. We have a transport for making ASCII requests. We also have a mock transport that we use lots within our own test suite so that we don't need to send requests in order to prod all of the buttons and make sure that everything fits together coherently. I mostly fit together coherently. And uh, you can also have alternate network implementations. So we have a, I think there's a gist somewhere, it's probably slightly out of date, maybe somebody could update it, which, bring, which provides a URL lib3 based network implementation for HTTPX. And that's kind of valuable because if you're trying to dig into issues or networking problems, you can switch out to a completely different networking layer and figure out is the problem over here or over here. So uh, layered design. Hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose I also wanted to say about this layered design. We've taken that kind of same approach to layering as well all the way through the stack. So we've been doing a lot of work in HTTP core lately addressing this kind of thing. So being able to go with, okay, here's the API design when you're working at the level of the connection pool, but also they're making sure that if you want to get down into more bare bones and not many people actually want to do this, but it's still kind of important from the purposes of being able to comprehend 
what is happening here. You can start using HTTP core, and then when you're getting more in-depth, go, I'd like to get rid of the connection pooling entirely and just starting with working with uh, a direct connection. Or then you can drop down another layer and say, I want to be specific about whether I'm working with an HTTP2 or an HTTP1 connection and not have the layer over the top of that anyway. Um, this is... This is just our test suite running for HTTPX, and it makes me content because, because of the layered design, we're doing very little actual networking at all, and we've got 100% test coverage and 100% ty type annotations all the way through, and everything just it runs really nicely and quickly, and it makes me happy even though it's only text on a screen. Uh, HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. Uh, okay, so HTTP 1 is a text-based protocol that is capable of handling a single request and response over a TCP stream at any one time. Whereas HTTP2 bought a whole bunch of performance improvements by allowing multiplexing of multiple TCP, re multiple HTTP requests and responses over a single TCP stream. So avoiding the need to have to uh, set up multiple uh, TCP streams when you're making lots of concurrent requests. Uh, as well as bringing a bunch of other stuff with it being a binary protocol, it's able to add new features such as flow control, which helps with the network efficiency, uh, header compression, which uh, improves the bandwidth, of, uh, bandwidth efficiency, server push, can't remember, is server push still a good idea or not? Did we find out that that didn't quite work as well as we were expecting, possibly? Oh, also, that's not what HTTP2 is. It's actually a PSYOP designed to entrap overly analytical minds into ever more complex uh, systems design so that they can just all do that stuff busily elsewhere and we can then focus on the more important stuff whilst they're getting too analytical because sometimes it's easy to focus on the wrong things, right, if you're not careful. Um, if you'd want a more conventional explanation of HTTP2, I would recommend the person who uh, developed the curl tool, Daniel. I always want to say Badger, but it's not Badger. It's Bagda, Daniel Bagda. Um, wrote a very good... Uh, com a very comprehensive document on this, which I rate. Oh, what am I saying here? Um, so in HTTPX, our HTTP support is off by default, but you can enable it when you configure the client just by adding a flag. Why have we taken this design decision? Okay, well, HTTP2 adds a whole bunch of clearly demonstrable performance improvements when you're in the context of a browser that don't always necessarily apply in the context of when you're working with a programmatic client because the, oh, I've forgotten the nice word for it, never mind. Um, crackers, okay, it's not crackers. Um, because the profile of the kinds of requests that you're making is very different. In a browser, you're almost always downloading a web page and then downloading a whole slew of resources that are associated with that web page, which might not be true when you're making API calls, for instance, and you're making lots of sequential API calls. Also, um, HTTP 2, da 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 while it's more network efficient, that comes with a cost, so it's more computationally complex. It doesn't matter so much in the context of the browser, because your browser's probably written in C++ or, or something else. I don't know what Safari's written in. I would check for Opera. No, but, uh, Opera is Opera sort of thing. It must be. That would be sad. That was really nice. Um, uh, yeah, but when you're working with Python, of course, the computational cost is proportionally higher. Oh, look, these are two really, really nice sans I.O. design paradigm libraries that we use. These are the libraries that we use for our HTTP parsing. 
and construction. So, and they are designed with, I don't know how many of you in the room will have heard of the Sonso paradigm, but if you're working with message parsing and networking, it's the only sensible approach, which is decoupling the actual doing stuff on the network versus the parsing and the message framing, and keep all of your I/O away from that. Uh, HTTP/3, we don't support that at the moment. The we probably will. I don't know why we will, because it probably won't end up being a performance improvement for anybody. But maybe it'll be really useful as a debugging tool for some folks. So that might be a good reason why we might do it. Uh, the performance improvement. Uh, HTTP/3. Over UDP, not over TCP. Duh, magic happens. Wonderful. Um, you know, ever more complex surface area comes with a cost. Uh, but, you know, I think we'll still do it because something. Um, oh, yeah, sync and async supports. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the big motivations for being able to have a client that works with almost exactly the same API, regardless of whether you're in the sync context or the async context. Um, so here's three different examples of using the client in three different contexts. Um, in the async context, we support both using it with async I.O. Uh, how many people work with async I.O., by the way? Okay, and with Trio, how many people use Trio at the moment? Okay, so use Trio, it's flipping wonderful. Um, if you can, so Trio pioneered uh, structured concurrency, and Trio has pioneered the here's how you uh, design a set of constraints around which to handle concurrency in a sensible way so that you're not leaking resources, um, which uh, da, 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 and it's also developed by one of the smartest people who I know within the sphere. Um, if you can't use Trio, because isn't it frustrating that it ends up being incompatible, um, there's a great package called AnyIO, which brings the same design constraints of structured concurrency to async IO that Trio has pioneered. Now, I know that the core devs are also working on bringing some of the same learnings that Trio has brought into async IO, but that's going to be a bunch of time. And there's, uh, you know, you're just exposed to so many primitives that you really don't want to be using with async IO at the moment. So, this is a little bit of the code base of HTTP core. How are we going to support both async and sync? Well, let's just bundle them all into the same package and have one as the single source of canonical truth, which has our, we need to be explicit about where our concurrency switches are. So it has async and await keywords in. And then you've got the sync code base, which is actually almost exactly the same, but doesn't have the explicit here are points of context switching anymore. So we have some tooling that we use where we're able to just work on uh, one of these flavors as his our source of truth and we'll mirror into the other one and our continuous integration when it runs make sure that the two are in sync uh, but we then don't really need to think about it, and that handles the translation of some of the class names some of the import names and the async and await keywords and if you want to know a little bit about that more i would look at the standalone package uh, unasync because our approach to that was based on what the URL 3 team were thinking about doing for their work, and that's their kind of standalone approach on that. Oh, we've got a command line client built into HTTPX, and it's really nice. It's really nice because there's almost nothing to it. You can go and look at the code base for the uh, single module that has that code in it, and it brings a, uh, a tool that you can work with with the CLI that translates directly onto the stuff that you'll be doing when you're working with the package itself, which I always find really satisfying. It's, it's yeah. And we're going to be able to do really nice things in there as well, like, you know, if you're working with HTTP2 and you need to do so, oh, never mind, I haven't got time for that. Uh, it uses Click. Click's great, isn't Click? Hey, aren't the Palettes team incredible? I mean, you know, Flask and all of the other wonderful things. Um, I really like Click. I think it's really nice. We also use uh, Rich for 
making the colors all fancy and nice. And if you haven't checked out the work that Textualize are doing with their work on consoles, their team are doing some really fun stuff. If you like retro console-y things, because I think retro console-y things are fun. Um, because we've been tackling this with a complete design refresh, we've been able to take a more comprehensive approach to request and response timeouts than you'll get if you're using requests at the moment. Uh, we've type annotated all the way through. Um, uh, people end up having kind of mixed bags on this. I think it's okay when you're working with it from scratch on a project, but trying to bring it into a project retrospectively, uh, less convinced about. But I mean, for us, it's been wonderful you know, being able to. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Right. Let's see. Oh, separation of concerns. Um, you know, I would hope with the way that our code base has been designed. So we've got HTTPX stuff at the top. We've got HTTP core stuff at the bottom. Really would like this to end up being a kind of learning resource. So, you know, you want to dig into being able to understand what's happening within the HTTP flow, that you're able to kind of comprehensively do that all the way through the different layers. Uh, the request and response models have actually been designed quite intentfully so that we could use it as a we could use it as a basis for a micro framework and doing stuff on the server side where there's a bunch of things that make that a bit fiddly and complicated and difficult to request but I haven't talked about my team about whether they'd want to do that or not um, you can also do some things that you're probably not going to want to do but that still might make you feel content that you can with HTTPX and HTTP core so Oh, I'm not really sure what I want to say about this. So, for example, right, uh, to be able to... Look, you can ask, how do I do any of these ridiculous things, if you want, and we'll be able to give you really good answers to those. And even in the areas like with gRPC, where we probably can't quite give you, you can do this right away here, we can give you, here's the very, very tiny amount of extra work that we're missing before you'd be able to get to, how can I use HTTPX to give me HTTP2 bidirectional streaming and support gRPC over the top of that. Why would you want to do that? Maybe because gRPC at the moment isn't really so much a protocol in reality, but it's actually just a tooling suite. And wouldn't it be nice if it was more, you know, in practice here are the different implementations? Oh my goodness me. Yes, I am. Uh, we are. We will. It is, that's the, 